we just sang deals with the goodness of God that he's shown to all people in his, in his grace. That is, all mankind enjoys the benefits that, that he has blessed them with, the, the kindness of human friends, the health, the blessings around us, all of that. And we'll be dealing with some of that this morning as we look to John chapter 2, as we continue our study through the Gospel of John. But let's ask the Lord's help as we begin. Our Heavenly Father, we are grateful for the time which we have here to spend in your presence as we have been blessed by your word. Lord, we cannot begin to look into the depths of it. We find ourselves inadequate in many ways to understand and to teach these things, some of these truths. But Lord, we pray for your help that you may bless us with what what we do understand and what has been revealed. I pray that your blessing would be on your people from your word this morning. Uh, not for any goodness in myself, Lord, but for the, through the power of your spirit and your word, we pray that you may use me, that uh, people's hearts may be lifted up to you, and that they may come to truly believe in who you are, and that their faith may be strengthened. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, we now look in John chapter 2. We finished John chapter 1. Uh, We've already discussed the fact that the whole Gospel of John is a series of witnesses or testimonies proving that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the Messiah, the second person of the Trinity, and that through believing in him, we may have eternal life. That's John chapter 20, verse 31. We've quoted that many times already. Uh, John chapter 1, as we discussed, gives us the verbal testimony of several witnesses. You have the author, John himself, the first 18 verses he, in the prologue. He tells us exactly who Jesus is as the eternal word of God, the creator come in the flesh. And then we have the testimony of John the Baptist. And we have a series of three days where he proclaims Christ as Messiah, as the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sin of the world. And then the last thing we discussed was, this, was the testimony of the disciples. When... Uh, They first heard John preach, and then they saw Jesus, and they followed Jesus, and they testified that he was the Messiah, the one prophesied in Moses, the Son of God, and the King of Israel. All of these testimonies we have in chapter 1. Now, chapter 3 moves us from the verbal testimony of others primarily to the Lord himself and his teaching and his works. Now, we'll still see plenty of verbal testimony coming from people, and this is in response to what they see in Jesus. But primarily, John now is emphasizing the works of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we begin with that in chapter 2 of John, with the wedding in Cana. Now, I, I would encourage you greatly, if you have the Bible, to open it and follow along as we go. It's important to not only hear the word, but to see it, that it, it may have its effect in your heart. Now, again, we're not going to to follow any particular outline, though I do have an outline. What we're going to do is just simply go through the passage as it is and bring out what truths we have along the way. First of all, looking at the setting of this particular miracle, verses 1 and 2. Verse 1, it says, on the third day. Now, this third day here, we find day after day after day, consecutive days going on here. But the third day here is more than likely from the call of Nathanael. If you remember, uh, Jesus went and called Nathanael. Nathanael believed who he was and followed Jesus. Nathanael was from Cana, we find a little later in the gospel. And they were traveling together. And Jesus then travels to this place, which is not too far from where he was, where John was baptizing, uh, to a wedding in Cana of Galilee. Now, looking at the context of this wedding, it's, we have to get the, the idea, uh, try to, to, to take yourself and remove yourself from 21st century Western world to the 1st century Eastern world to give you a better idea as to what the context is of this wedding. Marriage at that time, especially among the Jews, was conduct, conducted very differently from how we conduct a wedding. We have, first of all, a betrothal. There was a meeting together of the families and the bride and the groom, and there were certain promises made to each other. 
And this would go on for about a year or so. Now, this was a legal marriage. In other words, there's no way to break this apart except through a divorce. If you remember the story of Mary and Joseph, when Mary was found with child and Joseph knew the child wasn't his, he sought perhaps to divorce her in a, in a private manner as to not to embarrass her. Uh, but, of course, we know what happened there. The, the, the Lord revealed to him the truth that this was the Messiah that had come. But you see how, though they were not, had not yet come together, uh, in order to break this, this engagement is what we call, but a betrothal, he would have had to legally do it. So we had a year of this, and the purpose what, for this to, to, to go on was that the, the groom could prepare for married life. He would either build a place or he would add a, an addition to the family home of some sort, and he would save money so that he could then bring his bride from her house to his house, and then they have the celebration. Now, that's what's going on at this point. There is a family celebration. Oh, the, the guests would be here, the family, the, the friends, and, and whoever else uh, in the community, very small communities, if you recall. So there's a lot of people probably here. And the groom's family would be responsible for paying for the wedding feast. Now, nowadays, it's the bride's family, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, we did help pitch in for my son's wedding for a, the, one of the meals, but the, usually the burden now falls on the bride's family. It, it fell on the groom's family then, and the purpose was to show this guy can take care of this, this girl. Now, these parties would usually start on a Wednesday, if the girl was a virgin, it would start on a, on a Wednesday. If she was a widow, it would start on a Thursday. Now, why? I'm not sure, but that's how they did it. This was the biggest event of a person's life. I mean, they had a massive celebration. Now, they didn't have county fairs and other things like that, and they couldn't afford to do a lot of these things, but they scrimped and saved and worked for this particular day. This was the big day of a person's life. It was their wedding. Now, if you look to verse 1, at this wedding, we find that the mother of Jesus was present. She was there. Now, she's not mentioned by name. I don't think anywhere in this gospel is Mary mentioned by name. And perhaps John does that to avoid the confusion of the other Marys that are involved. But we know that she is, is there. She is probably a very close friend or family of the groom. We're not sure of that, but we can get that idea because she was more than just a guest. She knew, for example, when the wine ran out. For such, she had some connection. You know, a guest probably wouldn't know that until the, the last, very last moment and disaster strikes. But as they pour the last of the wine out, word comes to her that they're out of wine. Now, I'm sure they were still serving some of the wine that was left at that time, but there was no more to be had. So she knew that. And the other reason we can believe that she had more of an influence than just a guest was that she took action and went to Jesus to try to get this problem solved. So we believe that she had something to do with the actual feast, that she had some authority, and that she could tell the servants what to do. Now, there's only three places Mary is mentioned in the gospel. We have here in chapter 3. We have chapter 6, where, uh, the, where Jesus' family, that Mary and his brothers are waiting out, out for him. I'm sorry, that's, I'm thinking something different here. Chapter 6, when the crowd refers to uh, the family of, of Jesus and Mary. In other words, they knew who he was. They said, how can he be Messiah? We know his family is more or less what they're saying. And then we find at the foot of the cross when Mary is there and Jesus tells John, behold your mother, and he gives the responsibility of Mary over to John. So that's the three times that she's mentioned. So all through the Gospels, uh, where we find Mary, other than the birth narratives, she's just simply a participant or an observer. She has nothing to do with redemption. Now, you have in, in the Roman church, you have uh, Mary is like a co-redeemer to Jesus. Mary well, is the way to get to Jesus. So some of these things around us, some of our friends and neighbors teach. None of that is in the scripture. Now, what we have here is just Mary is the mother of our Lord and that she's blessed. In Luke chapter 1, verse 28, it says, And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. So that is as far as the exaltation of Mary goes. She's blessed among women. She's the mother of the Messiah. She had the privilege of raising the Messiah. 
But that's all. She has no spiritual interest, so to say, in our salvation. It is only Jesus and Jesus alone. Now, if someone believes more than that, they are holding to the superstition of men. Now, whether they are, are people that just sat around and discussed these things or perhaps were in a church council, if they come up with the idea, well, we need Mary to do this or we need to bring certain prayers to Mary to get to Jesus, that's all superstition of men. And we reject it completely because it is not based upon the word of God. So then moving on down to verse 2. We also find that Jesus was invited. Now, both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. Now, apparently, Jesus as family would have been invited, and his disciples, probably out of courtesy, were invited as well. Now, Nathaniel, we know, was from Cana. He may have had some connections with this as well. We don't know. All that we have to just guess at. Now, when Jesus came to the wedding, his presence there sanctioned marriage. In other words, Jesus showed his approval of marriage. Now, there's more, many more places than this in the scripture that we find this. But it's important enough, this event was important enough for Jesus to take time out of his ministry and come to this celebration. He had a very high view of marriage in the scripture. We can look at what Jesus taught and what he did and we can determine what is biblical marriage. Well, Jesus taught that. If you turn over to Matthew chapter 19, we'll briefly take a look at that. What did Jesus think of marriage? I never in my life... Thought I'm I'm fifty some years old. I forget how old I am. Fifty four, fifty three, fifty four. I think. I never dreamed that I'd ever have to get up and say, you know what, folks, marriage is between a man and a woman. It just you'd never thought you'd have to say that, but folks, we do now, because our culture has it all messed up. And let's see what Jesus said about marriage. He went to the feast. He went to the celebration of marriage, and then in, in Matthew chapter nineteen, looking at verse four, he said. And he answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them, that's man and woman, at the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore what God has joined together, let not man separate. There you have Jesus' teaching on marriage, his definition of marriage. He thought very highly of this. He participated in the celebration. And that's another thing. We know that Jesus was a person who loved people and he loved celebration. He was not a hermit like John the Baptist in the wilderness that his mission was just to preach, but he loved people and he rubbed shoulders with people in their joys and in their sorrows. Uh, to the point that his enemies used that against him. Luke chapter 7 and verse 34, it says, The Son of Man has come eating and drinking. And you say, look, a glutton and a wine-bibber, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. They used that against him, but he was a friend of sinners. So, at this wedding, this great celebration, we have a dilemma come up. Verse 3, And when they ran out of wine... So this was a very serious situation at this celebration. We'll get into that. But I want to take a quick look at this idea of wine. What exactly is this wine? Now, I've heard a lot of different things from a lot of different preachers. But taking a look at the scripture, I really don't want to get into a controversy, what the Bible says about wine. I really don't want to take the time into that. But I just want to briefly mention it. First of all, we must never go beyond the scripture. And when it, whenever we make demands upon people. Now, for example, uh, the, the, the Bible does talk about the use of wine. We know that this particular wine, a biblical wine, had alcohol in it. All wine did at that time. Now, what they would do is they would, would squeeze out the grapes, they'd grow the, the grapes, they'd squeeze out the grapes, and then they begin to store the wine. But in the storage, within a short period of time, it would begin to ferment. And what they would have to do then would be to take this wine... And diluted, either three parts water to two parts wine, or ten to one sometimes, depending on how bad the wine had gotten. But it all had some sort of alcohol in it. They had no proper storage and food preparation until the 1800s. 
Now, maybe you've heard of a man by Thomas Welch, uh, the Welch grape juice. Well, he was a Methodist, a Wesleyan Methodist minister. Now, they had in their discipline that you had to use unfermented grape juice in the, the Lord's table. This was quite a dilemma for them back in those days. He couldn't get into the refrigerator, and they didn't have bottled wine at that time, or bottled grape juice at that time. They had to, to do something. What they did was they either boiled raisins or they made a, like a cake of some sort. Of, they would, would dry out a bunch of Concord grapes or some type of grapes and then add water to that and boil it and come up with some type of a juice, which I can't imagine it tasted very good, but, but that was their, the way to do it. But Mr. Welch had an idea. Well, for me to, to, to do this, to, 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 pre, to prevent the fermentation, I had to do what Louis Pasteur did with pasteurization of milk. So Mr. Welsh took some grape juice and and bottles, boiled boiled the grape juice in the bottles, sealed the bottles when they were hot, and lo and behold, we have pasteurized grape juice, which stayed good until you actually opened it. There was no fermentation. But that wasn't until about 1860s, 1870s, somewhere around there. Up until that time, all wine had had some alcohol in it. So we don't believe that the Bible condemns alcohol per se. You know, I'm not going to, I may, as an ordained evangelical Methodist, I may get in trouble for what I'm saying here, but I have to stay with the Scripture. Okay, the Scripture just, just shows us that they did drink wine, and wine itself was a symbol of joy. Uh, what the, uh, uh, there's a rabbinic saying at that time, without wine there, was, there is no joy. And we read Psalm 104, verse 14. He causes the grass to grow for the cattle and vegetation and, and so on. And, and, and wine that makes glad the heart of man. So we have wine in the Bible. Now, there's other places. Wine was actually safer to drink than water in many places because the water, they didn't know what was in the water. There was all kinds of bacteria there. The wine with a, with a little tiny bit of alcohol in there actually killed off some of the bacteria. That's why Paul said to Timothy, don't drink any more water. Drink wine for your stomach's sake. Because the water he was getting apparently where he was was not very good and it was making him sick. So the wine was safer. So you, get, you get the idea. Uh, though we do have that in the scripture, we have many, many warnings against the overindulgence of wine as well. Uh, Proverbs chapter 20, verse 1. Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is a brawler. And whoever is led astray by it is not wise. 1 Corinthians 6, 10. Nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. So though wine itself may not be an evil, we are strongly warned against overindulgence in it. If I happen to, to be visiting your house, you don't have to hide the wine bottles or if you have a beer in your fridge. I'm not going to worry about that personally. Now, if I happen to see you stumbling around, you know, uh, you know what's going on here? Then we will have a church meeting about that and we'll have to help you somehow to overcome that. But you get the picture. So, we're not going to take the, the, one extreme position if the if position goes beyond the Word of God. But let me tell you this as well. I grew up in a home where alcohol was abused. And my parents were basically good people. My mother has since passed on, but they didn't see any problem with alcohol, and they would overindulge at times when I was younger. And to myself, I watched this, and I determined that as a young person, I am not going to get involved in this. I've never had anything to drink. Never, I, I did taste a beer once, and I, as a kid, accidentally, I think I may have mentioned, <clears throat> watching a Pirates game and reaching over to get my soda. And my stepdad had his beer there, and I grabbed the beer, and I spit it out all over the floor. I didn't like it. And at one time as an adult, I tried wine. I didn't like the taste of it, and I said, well, I don't need that stuff. So I personally don't indulge in it. So you can't be saying, Pastor Gall is preaching this because he just loves to drink. <laughs> you know, I, don't, I don't drink at all, folks. But what I'm trying to say is stay with the Word of God, and don't overindulge where the Bible warns us. And if you have a problem with that, stay away from it. You know, personally, I don't know. If I did start drinking, maybe it would overtake me. I don't know. So I don't. But just anyway, we need to stay with the Word of God. A.T. Robertson, who believed that this wine that Jesus made was alcoholic, he said this, This fact does not mean Jesus would approve of the modern liquor trade with its damnable 
influences. So yes, the Bible does talk about wine, but we have to also look at the strong drink of today in the way it's used. It, that, it doesn't coincide. So we need to avoid that. If we want, uh, as a, in our own homes or whatever, to, to indulge in that occasionally in moderation, that's your business. It's not my business. But we are not to overindulge. We know that. And then moving on to the social crisis. We mentioned they are out of wine. We have verse 3. She said they have no wine. Mary said to Jesus. What that literally means is the wine gave out. Now because of our abundance, we don't consider the gravity of this situation. You know, a few weeks ago we had the Lord's table. Uh, the uh, people who were preparing it realized there's no juice here. So well, they just took off, went to the store, tried to find what they could. I think we ended up using some sort of a grape soda or something. But we had that option. <laughs> they didn't have that option. They didn't have sheets or 7-Elevens or Walmarts or anything like that. You know, they, to them, this was a disaster. It wasn't just because of that. Wine was a staple drink. And as I mentioned, the water could be dangerous. So now there's nothing to drink here. It was considered an absolute necessity at a feast. You had to have this. And the groom and his family were responsible to make sure there was enough. And if there wasn't enough, they could actually be sued by their neighbors and by the bride's family. Now, you, you've just ruined everything. This was a horrible social stigma. It was a strike against the groom. The groom was supposed to have everything prepared. Now, how is he going to be a good husband if he can't pre- prepare a feast uh, and he fails at that. He, so you get the idea. This is a horrible situation. You know, to, now to us, we'd say, oh, not a big deal. We just run down to the store, buy a little bit more. We're okay. Not to them. Uh, this would put the family off to a very bad start, the bride and the groom. Uh, there would be the social stigma of their celebration, which would last the rest of their lives. As soon as their name's mentioned, you know, so oh, yes, I know them. <laughs> their wedding feast, they ran out of wine. That's how serious it was. I mean, they could be 50 years old. Yeah, I remember them. They we ran out of wine. But it also would put them under, possibly under a financial obligation. If they had attended a feast and they enjoyed the wine of somebody else, this person came to their feast and they ran out of wine, that person could legally sue them. And sometimes they did. There's records of that in, in, the, in that time period. So you get the idea how serious of a situation this was. Now, Mary was involved in the serving. As we mentioned, she was more than just a guest. She was there helping. She takes the problem to Jesus in verse 3. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Now, there is some speculation. See, we have bottled water, so we, we don't have to worry about that. Sorry about that. but um, There was some speculation as to why Mary came to Jesus, what she expected from him. Some believe that she expected a miracle from him. I personally don't believe that to be the case, and many of the other commentators don't as well, that Jesus had never performed a miracle up to this point. So we have no reason to think that Mary came thinking that Jesus would somehow miraculously solve the problem. But more than likely, as most commentators believe, Mary was a widow by this time. We know for a fact she was a widow whenever the Lord was crucified. Because when the Lord was crucified, there's no mention of Joseph being there. And what did, what did Jesus do with his mom? He put her under the care of John. So we know that there was no Joseph at that point. Now this was only three years before that time. So it's believed that probably, when you look at the, at the family of Jesus, there was at least seven children involved. So Joseph would have been involved in that. Joseph is last mentioned when Jesus is 12. And then you have other children uh, that came into the family. He would have been there for probably, my guess is probably within the past five or about the most 10 years Joseph had, had died. So, so we know that, that Mary is a widow. And Jesus, being the oldest son, would have taken on the responsibility of head of household. So we know that because he transferred that to John with his mother. She probably expected Jesus to come up with a solution. I mean, can you imagine you being a mother, you're now a widow, you have an oldest son, who's the son of God, the Messiah? And you know that because an angel told you that, living in your house. 
oh, we have a dilemma here. Jesus, what should I do? And Jesus gives perfect and pure advice, human advice, but it's always well thought out, not tainted with sin, and she would be used to that for who knows how many years. Well, here's a problem, and she comes to Jesus again. However, we have an unusual response of Jesus. Let's take a look at that in verse 4. Jesus said to her, Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Now, we look at this in English, and I remember reading this as a young man thinking, Whoa, well, that's very rude to, to say something like that to your mother. I, I, as a kid, I would say certain things to my mother, and I'd get slapped if I was not respectful to my mother. And it almost sounds, in English, it almost sounds rude. We don't call people, Woman! You know, if we said that, how many of you ladies would be happy if I said, woman? Oh, you'd be very highly offended. My wife would be very highly offended. I don't think I'd ever would say that to my wife. But you get the picture. But in the Greek, it's not like that. If you can picture, for example, the Middle Ages, and you call somebody, say, a person talks to a, a, a lady and says, my lady. Or today we say, ma'am. Something very polite in the original language, it's something that's polite. It's not an offense by any means. It's difficult to translate into the English, and that's why it's like that. So you have Jesus then saying, what does your concern have to do with me? Or in a sense, this is a gentle rebuke to her. What do we have together to do in this situation? What Jesus is now pointing out to Mary is that Mary you've overstepped your bounds Jesus has been baptized by John Jesus has now begun his ministry as Messiah which is now leading to the cross and to the redemption of his people Mary comes in and with a problem we don't have any wine Jesus she says, he says wait a minute Mary you are used to approaching me as my mother that relationship has now changed. I am your Lord. I am your Messiah. You come to me as a disciple to her Lord. Basically is what that means. So the answer that she got was a gentle rebuke, which once again takes us to that point. Anytime somebody tries to exalt Mary to the point of equality with Jesus or anywhere near that, it's blasphemy and to be avoided. So, and I know saying that in this area can be dangerous. <laughs> Not as dangerous as drawing a picture of Mohammed, thankfully. But when we talk about Mary, we need to keep Mary in her proper place. Mary was a disciple who needed a savior. And that's what Jesus is saying. Matthew chapter 12, verse 49. This is what I referred to earlier. Remember, the family came looking for Jesus. And what Jesus say to the crowd, he said, and he stretched out his hand toward his disciples and said, here are my mother and my brothers. They came, the crowd came to him and said, Jesus, your mother and your brothers are looking for you. They're outside the crowd here. And Jesus says, what, what does that have to do with my ministry? Here's my mother and my brothers right here. Those are to believe in me. Those who want to do the will of God. So you, you get the picture. There is no longer a family relationship involved. But there is a relationship of disciple to Lord or sinner to Savior. And this is a gentle rebuke. So Mary is rebuked and Jesus says, my hour has not yet come. Now this could be pointing to the hour of, his, of the cross or it could be pointing to the hour where he is revealed as Messiah. And he, he has not completely revealed himself to the world yet as the Messiah. And he's beginning, he's going to do that. Now, however, we know that Mary did not think this was a no, because look what she says in verse 5. She says, his mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Now, let me say, we go back to Mary as we've talked about her before. If you want to listen to what Mary says, this is what you listen to right here. Don't listen to what some superstitious people have told you about Mary, that you're to pray to Mary. But listen to what she says in the word of God. She says, you do whatever Jesus said. That solves the problem right there. She went to the servants and told the servants that whatever Jesus tells you to do, 
You do that. That's the best advice anybody could give. So the solution then we find in verse 5 as we begin, she took the problem to the servants and told them, whatever Jesus tells you to do, do that. And what did Jesus tell them? Well, Jesus, verse, verse 6 through 8, we, yeah, we, we find the answer that Jesus comes up with. But in the house, verse 6, now there were set there six water pots of stone according to the manner of the purification of the Jews containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. Now these are very interesting. We don't have this in our homes. But because of the customs of the Jews, we find that in the book of Mark chapter 7. And I'm off of my notes here again. But it, Oh yes, there it is. Mark chapter 7 and verse 3. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands in a special way, holding the tradition of the elders. So there would, each home would have these ceremonial pots that would be filled with water, that the water would be drawn out so that the per- people can ceremonially, ceremonially wash before they eat. This was a practice of the Jews. It was something the Pharisees had added to the law. Not necessarily a hygienic thing as we do. We always tell the kids, wash your hands before you eat. Now, this is something that was religious. They had these water pots there, and there was, was uh, six of them. And they were, would hold 20 to 30 gallons each. Now, we don't know if maybe they borrowed some of these pots for the occasion, which may well have been. But these pots were never used for, for juice or anything like that. They were only used for purification purposes. And that's important. We'll find out later. Jesus tells the servants to take these pots or to, to fill these pots with water. In verse 7. And we're looking at 120 to 180 gallons. These are rather large pots. I mean, that would be the total, about 120 to 180 gallons. There may have been water in them already. There probably was because they were there for the purification purposes. Now, they would have been been, uh, quite drained by now if there was water in them to begin with. Jesus says, fill the water pots with water. They filled the water pots with water up to the brim. Now that's important, because if it's filled to the brim, there's no room for anything else. There is now water completely filling the water pots. They're then told, draw it out, verse 8. Draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast. And so they did so. They drew out some of the water, gave it to the master of the feast. This would have been like the head waiter, the master of ceremonies, whoever was in charge of making sure that the tables were set right, the food was right, the food was properly prepared he would be tasting all these things they took it to him he would have known that the wine had ran out they came oh they come up with some more wine that's great he tastes it and he's flabbergasted verse 9 when the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and did not know where it came from but the servants who had drawn the water knew the master of the feast called the bridegroom so here we have the master of the feast taste this wine and he he said, I've got to get a hold of the bridegroom. Now remember, the bridegroom and his family are the ones in charge of making sure there's enough wine and food and everything for the celebration. So they, they take this to him. And he says, verse 10, And he said to them, Every man at the beginning sets out good wine, the good wine. And when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior. You have kept the good wine until now. So that you have saved the best for last. So this wine that was now the that Jesus had made from nothing, actually the water was it was in there. He replaced the water with wine. Was so good that this man had to make a statement. This this is unbelievable. Usually you start with the very best, and this is probably the best he ever tasted. You've waited until now. Now, the reason that they would wait, and they would have varying degrees of quality of wines in those days, you'd start with the very best because that's when people are thirsty. That's when they're going to notice it. But after they've drunk for a while and they've eaten for a while, their tongues are getting a little worn out, and you just begin to drink and you don't notice a whole lot. So that's why you'd say, well, we're going to have the very best now, and we'll save this other stuff for later. It's cheaper. We'll just use that later once everybody had had enough. But this was reversed. Now the very best is used. Now there are some which would say that this, there are people that don't believe in miracles you know, in the Bible. I mean, I'm not saying about the miracles that we shouldn't believe in, that you see on TV, 
from these fake preachers, but the miracles of the Scripture. They'll look at this, oh, uh, that, that, that couldn't happen. They'll try to explain it away, like the Red Sea thing. Well, we don't believe they really came across the Red Sea. They went across the Reed Sea, which is po- at points was only a few inches deep, and blah, blah, blah. Of course, then you have the issue of Pharaoh. How did he get drowned in this couple inches of water? You know, and things like that. They would try to come up with reasons. For example, the, uh, the manna that came down from heaven, these unbelievers... We'll look at the Bible and they'll say, well, that, there was a bug that would secrete a certain type of stuff and it would, it would be on the plants and get hard and people could eat that. Uh, I would not want to be eating bug poop. You know, that manna was not bug. That, that's what they do. Well, they look at this and they say, well, probably the bottom of those pots, well, there were dregs for, uh, from other wine, dried wine sitting at the bottom. They added the water and it got mixed in and it just happened to turn into a decent wine. Folks, have you ever drunk the bottom of your cups? You know what's at the bottom of your cups? You know, my, my, my wife's not here, but let me tell you something. She drinks something. She wants to know what's on the bottom. And if she gives me something to drink, it doesn't touch my lips. Like, she's very concerned. She doesn't want anything at the bottom of her drink. That's not good stuff. It's in the bottom of it. But somehow this made an amazing wine, better than anybody ever drank. Now, that's just complete, utter nonsense and unbelief. The other thing is, these pots were never used for for wine. They were ceremonial pots. It would have been horrible. And what Jesus did there, if the Pharisees would have been there, they would have, oh, no, no, you can't do that. These are special pots. Of course, it was all man-made stuff. But they would have had a conniption fit. So, no, wine was never used in these things before. It was filled to the brim. This was wine that Jesus, through the simple power of his will, his divine will, transferred, created Wine out of nothing. And this was the best wine of the feast. Jesus made wine without the sun, without the grapes, without a vine, without the squeezing or the, the trampling of the grapes, without the processing of any sort. He made it through the simple will of his power. Now, verse 11, we find the, the conclusion of all this. This beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. This miracle, this sign, was the beginning of signs. Now, you may have heard, especially in our Roman Catholic background, and I also have a Roman Catholic background, so I know what, where you're coming from, that there's apocryphal books and ideas about Jesus as a child, that Jesus would go around performing miracles as a child. Oh, there's a bird with a broken wing. Jesus would go pick up the bird, and the bird would fly away. There's all kinds of stories like that. Folks, all of that is fables and nonsense. We know from the Word of God, this is the very first miracle that Jesus performed. This miracle is called a sign. A sign is a miraculous event that points to a greater spiritual truth. What was this sign pointing to? These all, all the signs pointed to the fact of Jesus Christ as the Son of God, Messiah. Look over to chapter 10. John chapter 10, looking at verse 24. Jesus talks about his works. John chapter 10 and verse 24. Then the Jews surrounded him, And said to him, How long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you did not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. Okay, what Jesus said here is, If you're the Messiah, why don't you tell us plainly? And Jesus said, I already have. Look around you. Look what I have done. These signs were given for the purpose of people seeing that he is Messiah. Now look over to verse, down to verse 31 of chapter 10. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, Many good works I have shown you from my Father. For which of those works do you stone me? Jesus answered, saying, or the Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. And because you, being a man, make yourself God. All of these works are pointing to who he was. He was the Son of God, but they refused to believe these signs which all pointed to that. Look down to verse 37. If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. 
But if I do, though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. All of these works, these signs, the purpose of those was to simply show us that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the eternal second person of the Trinity come in human flesh. We must believe in him. The purpose of all of this, the purpose of these signs was to manifest his glory. Verse 11, manifest his own glory. Man does not have any glory to manifest. We, have, we are full of sin. But Jesus manifested his own glory. Now, all of the Lord's works have a purpose. Now, this, wor- this miracle, one of the purposes was to save this couple from financial ruin and from societal embarrassment for the rest of their lives. And Jesus did so. We have blind people getting their sight, lepers being cleansed, lame people walking, the dead being raised, all these things. They all had a purpose. There was people suffering, people in need. Jesus filled that need. But the primary reason of these works is to manifest his own glory. This is the glory we find in chapter 1. We've already looked at. If you turn back to John chapter 1, verse 14. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten Father, full of grace and truth. This is the glory of God manifested to mankind. Jesus veiled that glory for most of his ministry. Whenever he did these things, he took the veil away a little bit and said, this is who I am. I can create wine out of nothing. I can give this man new eyes that he can see. I can raise this person from the dead because he'd take the veil away of his flesh a little bit and they would see he is the son of God. You know, I deal with Jehovah's Witnesses sometimes and that's uh, one thing that I, that I have, have gotten used to over the years. They seem to come, they want to come to me and argue with me a lot. So, you know, they look, sometimes they look me out for some reason. But this is one thing I always point them to about Jesus Christ. I would tell them, if Jesus is who he, you say he is, I want nothing to do with that Jesus. But let me tell you about the Jesus of the Bible. And I take them to John chapter 17. If you turn over there, please, we'll close with this. John chapter 17, the glory of God. John 17 and verse 5. Jesus is praying. And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. This is the glory that Jesus is manifesting. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 5. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. This is the glory of the Lord Jehovah. Jesus possessed the glory of the Lord Jehovah because he was one with the Lord Jehovah. What was the result? His disciples believed. You know, folks, what we need to do is present Jesus for who he really is. Jesus is not a figment of a person's imagination, somebody who he comes and teaches nice things and is always kind and gentle and never ever goes against the grain or criticizes. He just sits there meek and mild. No, no, no. We're going to find out the next time. Next week I won't be here, but the week following. That Jesus has the massive power of God and when he exercises, it is a very fearful thing. But we'll get to that with the next chapter, the, the next section of chapter 3. But... Jesus reveals the glory of God. Jehovah said, I will reveal my glory. Uh, There's no one else to share in my glory. But why can Jesus then express? Because he is Jehovah. And we need to see that and we need to believe. These works of Christ testify who he is and demand that we place our faith in him. There's no other. You have sin. You have a sin problem. You can't keep the commandments. You know that. Your problem is sin. Your only hope is found in Jesus Christ. That's the message. Who he is reveals all of that. We can trust in him. Next time we will see his great power revealed again. Let's go to prayer.